Hello, and welcome to Historic Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in the heart of downtown San Jose. My name is Julia, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the worship of God in whatever way you're able to be here, online or in person. Today, in person at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, we have the particular privilege of welcoming the Reverend Rachel Tabor Hamilton, Vice President of the Episcopal Church's House of Deputies, kind of like the lower house of Congress, um, a First Nations person who will be bringing her perspective on the role of the church in justice making. Rachel will be preaching live at Trinity, but here online, we have um, a sermon that she preached a couple of years ago with very similar themes and responding to similar passages that are going to be read in church today. So I invite you in your hearts to welcome Rachel, Reverend Rachel, and also I invite you into prayer. Oh God. Because without you or we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave as he went out came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him in prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, 
came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. This Gospel reading from Matthew is one of those ones that you take a look at it and read it and it sounds like it's pretty harsh, especially at the end. And this idea that we have to keep forgiving no matter how many times someone sins against us also seems and feels quite hard. But there's something quite specific happening here that is captured in the original Koine Greek that our translation does not necessarily do justice to. And so the issue becomes quite confusing. Are we talking about every time someone harms us or does a sinful action against us that we should keep forgiving that? That sounds fairly abusive. Well, it makes a little more sense, to me anyway, if we go back and look at that Greek again and understand the consistency of the use of language that is not sin and forgiveness, but debt and forgiveness. Debt as a relational aspect in the human community, and particularly for Matthew, in the community of the church. What Matthew is doing here is this is several years, decades after the events of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. And what our gospel writer is doing here is talking to his community by using an example of a lived moment with Jesus and the disciples, but talking quite specifically, even as we do with hermeneutics today, nice million dollar word, but how we interpret scripture in our own context. That's what Matthew is also doing. So the original Greek, let's, let's go there a little bit. First of all, that opening sentence that's given to us is, Lord, another member of this church sins against me. How often should I forgive? So the word in Greek for church is being used there is actually not the ecclesia, which becomes known as church. The word being used there in the Greek is the calling out, calling out of communities for specifically religious purposes. So if another member of this intentional religious gathering, people who are committed to being in relationship with God and to one another, that's the image. If someone who is promised to be in intentional relationship with me in a way that means a spiritual and genuine reciprocity, if they kind of keep, you know, I give things and they keep taking them, should I keep forgiving that debt? So if someone from an intentional spiritual relationship does not pay, so would the better translation be, Lord, how often will my brother be indebted to me and I will forgive him? Because the idea in that early church is it's a different kind of family, a different kind of way of being together and all that people have kind of come into a common pot or people reach out to one another in that community of generosity and hospitality and when they see a need, they take from that common account, that common store and give it to those in need. 
So it know that interpersonal relationship is not only an interpersonal relationship, it's being informed by a relationship with God and a mutual commitment. And in normal outside society of that context, that sense of debt in a power system creates someone above and puts someone else in obligation to them. And so what we're hearing from Jesus is in the context of people who've made an intentional commitment to be in relationship and share what they have, out of the recognition that everything the community has and the individuals have, have been given to them by God, then in that context of understanding, it's not possible to operate from a power relationship because it's mutuality. It's a recognition of a spiritual and genuine interdependence upon one another. And not asking any one member to go begging to the other. By dismembering that hierarchical relationship which is in the world outside. There is this tremendous equity. And the accounting of God, that language of accounting, comes up again and again throughout the whole reading. Until the very end the accounting is... When we die, we give an account to God. This is a very intentional, I think, play on that word, to give an account. To give an account of our lives, of how we've done with what all God has given to us. Did we spiritually and really operate out of the same type of radical generosity that God has done. Because in the end, it's not about God being the king. Heaven isn't God is the king who then meets out punishment. That's not the correct reading. It is we sometimes in society, when we have that unleveled relationship, people who have much can abuse those who have less. And those who have less can abuse those who have nothing. And in that kind of social economic disparity, we, you and I, and the church, are called to throw all of that hierarchical idea of indebtedness that causes inequality, not only financially, but in every other social currency kind of way, to throw all of that out and operate from a genuine mutuality, a genuine sense of how the person in front of us is a gift from God. And what God has made in us and given to us is a gift from God. And at the end of the day, what we're doing is sharing God's gifts. And those who have much have just as much as the next. When all are truly valued. Today in the church is known as UBE Sunday. This means the Union of Black Episcopalians. The Union of Black Episcopalians has a unique and significant history that's actually far older than the Civil Rights Movement, where we normally pin social justice issues for African American and black Americans. I want to share with you that on this Sunday, what normally happens for the Union of Black Episcopalians is they transfer the celebration day of a man named Alexander Crummel, from who's normally celebrated on September 10th, that would have been Thursday, and transferred onto UBE Sunday. Alexander Crummel was born in 1819. He was a black man living in New York City and struggled against racism all his life. As a young man of color, in those days, in the 1800s, he was driven out of a school academy in New Hampshire because of his color. He was dismissed as a candidate for holy orders in the Episcopal Church in New York and rejected for admittance to General Seminary because of the color of his skin. 
but eventually he was ordained in 1844 as a priest in the Diocese of Massachusetts. He left for England after being excluded, however, from the Massachusetts Diocesan Convention. When he could have no voice there, he went to England and studied at Cambridge University. And afterwards, he went as a missionary to Liberia, where a model Christian republic seemed possible. The vision embraced by Crummel included European education and technology, but also traditional communal culture, and a national Episcopal church headed by a black bishop. That was his vision. And he traveled extensively in the United States, urging blacks to immigrate to Liberia and to help support the work of the Episcopal church there. But early movements in this country kept the interest of black African Americans here, who were fighting their own issues of justice and inequality in the United States. So eventually, after he returned from Liberia, he worked to establish a National Episcopal Church political opposition, and a loss of funding finally forced him to return. And there in the United States, he concentrated his efforts on establishing a strong urban presence of independent black congregations that would be centers of worship, education, and social service. When Southern bishops proposed that a separate missionary district be created for those black congregations, Crummel created a national convocation to defeat that proposal, to not be separate but to be in the midst of and very much an active part of the Episcopal Church. The Union of Black Episcopalians is an outgrowth of that organization initially created. This history of racism in the church is not done. And it took many, many years to even get to the place of fulfilling even the smallest part of Crummel's dream, which was to have an African-American bishop for the United States, for the Episcopal Church, as even an international organization. That did not happen until the consecration of Barbara Harris, the first woman consecrated in the Anglican Communion. And when she was consecrated in 1983, that was the moment when this church and this communion realized that something new was finally happening. Barbara died just this year in March, and her legacy contributed to the ability of this church to consecrate additional African American bishops. Michael Curry is our presiding bishop of the church, who was consecrated as presiding bishop and elected in 2015. He's known now in the world as the bishop who gave the sermon at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Merkel. In that sermon, and in almost every sermon that Bishop Curry gives, he talks about the power of love. And he often is frequently quoted as saying, if it's not about love, it's not about God. The story of the ungrateful servant connects to the church in many ways, connects to our personal lives in many ways, and certainly connects to the experience of people of color. If we are to be truly a church dedicated to creating a society or at least within the church, a reality in which hierarchy does not enslave people, but rather that the equity of the church and the reciprocity of spiritual gifts recognizes the sacred value of all people of color and does not in any way, spiritually, physically, financially, ask them to be in debt to a hierarchy of injustice. 
In our diocese, for example, we have exactly one ordained African American who is an active clergy person. The Reverend Carla Robinson is recognized throughout the diocese as a phenomenally talented preacher. And I must say, the people are happy to use her for that. Emphasis on the word use, because the 13 positions for which she has applied for full-time employment since her ordination, she has not been hired. She works part-time at a congregation in our diocese, when she should, in fact, be recognized as a leader among our people of color in ways that are real and recognize her value. And the same could be said for our clergy of color in the Cambodian church in Tacoma with the priest recently ordained Rong B, who currently receives no stipend because of the economic nature of his Cambodian community. There are others like that who are engaged in Hispanic ministry. And my friends, I remain standing before you the only known ordained native person in the history of this diocese. And that has remained true since my ordination in 2003. We have a ways to go, and we must call to account those who have the authority and the power and the responsibility to create a different reality, not only for our people of color, but for all of us who are called into the challenge of living from genuine equality, from a place of forgiving our debtors as we forgive ourselves. God is generous. The cost upon us can never be repaid to God. The only way it can ever be acted into reality is in the way that we recognize one another's value. That has to be tangible it has to be actual. It has to be a commitment made in our diocese and in the Episcopal Church that is financial, that is spiritual, that is transformational, and that does not place the burden on people of color for doing all the work. Because if it's not about love, then it's not about God. And then what are we doing? And so in Christ's name, let us follow in that wonderful parade behind Alexander Crummel, Barbara Harris, presiding Bishop Michael Curry, Carla Robinson, and all of our glorious people of color in the Episcopal Church. In Christ's name, amen. amen.